Welcome to Leave No Doubt. I've been joined by Marlon Pack. Marlon, thank you for being here, mate. Thanks for having me, mate. How you doing, all right? Yeah, good, mate. Yeah, pre-season at the minute, so uh, you come at a good time, though. We've uh, got just over a week to go, so everything's died down a bit now, so it's all, it's all a lot of ta- tactical stuff. Perfect. Um, to get us started, mate, like, uh, like many other professionals throughout the country, you spent almost your whole youth career in an academy, obviously, where we are here in Portsmouth. At what age were you aware of how challenging it was going to be to become a professional? You know, that's a really good question. Probably, I'd say, later stage of uh, being in the youth team. I think as a young lad, you kind of take it all in your stride. As much as we're probably uh, majority of young boys have aspirations, ambitions to be a footballer. Um, I, was, I was fortunately enough to kind of live that dream, live, live, live those ambitions. Um, but as a young lad, I think, are you thinking about the bigger picture in the future? No, you're thinking about that. that so sort of thing. 15, um, 16 years old. It 15, 16. Come. I think when you're leaving school um, and your mates are potentially going off to colleges, um, thinking about what to do, because um, that's a big step. You know, you go from school where you've got no care in the world and then next minute you're in the, you're in the big world. Um, and then for me to carry on playing football, um, kind of rolling that kind of school mentality in as well, where you're still with your mates. Um, and then probably the next step was when if you get a pro and then if you're a professional, then I think that's when you really look to try and kick on. So how do you think during that time, mate, your mentality changed from playing for fun, even though it was obviously in an academy environment, yeah. playing for fun to playing for a career? I think in life and in anything, there's a, there's a balance in that, isn't there? Um, I think what I've tried to maintain throughout my whole career, is, even as a young lad, is trying to be true to myself and the character. Um, so always trying to do things right. Um, I think luckily enough, the environment I was in, you know, being a Portsmouth lad, coming through at Portsmouth, you know, doing jobs, for example, for Kev the kit man at, um, on a match day where you get to rub shoulders with Premier League players. Um, I think for me, it was... Um, we had fun. I, 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 like I said, I knew, knew the balance, knew the fine line of when it was an opportunity to have fun and have a laugh, but, and also um, when you had to knuckle down and get your head down and work hard. Um, I think football was a little bit different back then. You couldn't get away with the stuff that potentially you get away with now. Um, and there was obviously stuff in place for us to kind of keep us level-headed and, and grounded. Um, and also I think, you know, kind of where I grew up and, and stuff like that has helped me kind of maintain that vision throughout. Where do you sit on that argument now then obviously between old school and new school about young lads having responsibilities and doing jobs and, and those match day experiences that, you know, I left the, the Portsmouth Academy when I was 15, but I remember speaking to a Bournemouth when I was in, in their youth team. We didn't have to really do that as much because the, the youth team and the first team were separate. But the guys of my age, obviously I was a year above you in the academy, were always exposed to those match day experiences, knocking around, you know, as you say, Premier League players even if it was the collecting the balls from the warm-up on a match day, those experiences, what, what did those experiences do for you? See, I like to see myself as kind of forward-thinking and modern, but I have, I think that those old-school values, um, I think they're key. I, I really do. Uh, um, you hear saying the game's gone all the time. You, you know what it's like being in the dressing room. But I think an element has, I think people are too soft now, and, and obviously not just in football, environment but in society in general um like i said those, those grounding for me at that level was yeah you're working hard but you're doing these jobs you have to you know for example kev the kit man would make us obviously we, we were assigned players boots to clean they had to be cleaned you'd call your name out on a friday you'd come in with your players boots you made sure they're packed clean the dressing rooms away home referee dressing rooms but then on the flip side of that Bratton park corridor um, in the tunnel tight you got Sir Alex Ferguson David Beckham so for me I was doing those jobs a lot being a local boy being a Portsmouth supporter but then I got to watch AC Milan here I got to so uh, there's a balance in that um, but I think I think they're key I think it gives you a good grounding it, um, it keeps you on your feet um, and also it teaches you to work it teaches you to work to work for things um, yeah, so it's a shame that's gone because then you also build relationships. For example, now if I had a boot boy, 
I would like to have a boot boy say in my position. So he's coming up to me, I'm building relationships in that way. So he's cleaning my boots, but he's also going, you know, for me, for example, I used to ask questions as a young lad. Um, I went on pre-season tour with Portsmouth and just remember sitting down for breakfast with Michael Brown and just asking him, what, you know, how can I improve? What do you think I need to do in my game? How do I get to your level? Just, just those little hints that I think would be valuable. So I think it, it's really hard in football because I think sometimes the first team is there and then the youth team are all the way there in regards to actual playing career. But you, then you're also you're probably getting a lot of the kind of treasures and gold quite early without actually fulfilling a career. Um, and sometimes you get first team environment that you know sometimes the youth team are not even training in the building. So. I, you know, I, I would love to see that back in some kind of capacities where, like you said, I think first and foremost, you're building personal relationships with young lads. And um, and fairness, what we're doing here at Portsmouth, I think there might be an element of that, not in regards to the jobs, because I think that's completely gone, but kind of trying to nurture and being a mentor to, to some younger players. You've obviously got a very keen eye for the game, mate, and, and there's a lot of pros that, that, that we will know and that other people listening hopefully will know that, don't like football they play and they're, and they're not really involved in it they don't like talking about it and you know I know that that's not you um, to have that confidence or maybe, maybe not even confidence but to have that awareness um, and that humbleness when you're young to ask older pros for advice um, where did that sort of come from because uh, I mean in my opinion I don't think that exists that much anymore like I don't I don't see many young players asking for advice I, I, I see young players now thinking that they already know everything yeah, I think I think you're spot on. Um, I don't know. I I, I I think it's probably having that desire to succeed. Um, and I'll, I think even now, like what what have you got to lose? Um, I think ultimately, every person, if you're in, if you're in a young lad and you're in that environment, those people that you should be looking up to. So, for example, if you're in the youth team, uh, the under twenty threes, you should be looking. For me, even on a Saturday, you should be going to games and watching whoever's in your position, um, watching him play, seeing what he does, and then asking him questions. Um, I, I don't know what it is. It might be a pride thing. It may be an ego thing. Um, I, I don't know. For me, I've all, I just had that ambition to succeed and um, quite strong to say nothing was going to stop me because there's obviously external factors that sometimes you can't control, but things that I could take control of, I, I try to. I think during that period of time when you were just left school in those two years that you were in the youth team, I'd obviously left by that point, but even the guys that, um, that were in my age group, you were sort of the first batch of players at Portsmouth that sort of rode the wave of the first team in terms of the Premier League. Yeah. And by that, I mean that there were other players coming into that youth team from, in, from abroad that there was international players now because they were trying to bridge the gap between the quality of the first team and, and the youth team and and regularly really up until that point all the guys in the youth team had been local lads um, I'm interested to know what that did to you to have lads from from abroad coming into your youth team I'm not saying your youth team is in Portsmouth's youth team what did that do to you in, in terms of the competition and, and in terms of your hunger to really break through into that first team yeah, I think um, I think it was literally my first year, my as a first year scholar. That was when, in all honesty, the the club were pumping quite a lot of money into into the youth system. Um, various players coming in from France and abroad and all over Europe, with obviously the rumours of them being on very good money, um, and you know some of us on just scholar wage. I think at the time maybe eighty pound a week. Um, I think you've got to use it. I think you've always got to use that as fuel. Um, try and prove that you're better than them. Um, I think we, as a group, we're all, always welcome, welcoming. But I think for me, I'm looking at these players and think, OK, you're, you're being brought in. Now I'm going to show, I'm going to show you that I, I deserve to be here and I'm better than what you're bringing in. Um, that was probably a lot. There was a lot of situations like that and examples where even at a younger age, say like under 14s, level 15s, I knew lads that already had scholarships and as you're aware at the time you, I was one and you probably were the same that you're fighting every year for that renewal so I was on the kind of one year renewals and then it might you might get a two year deal but you know I'm hearing lads that are signing four year contracts at the age of like 12 like four, and they've already got their scholarship so listen everyone's an individual players develop differently and I'm one that 
probably got better as I got older. Um, but I think my mentality, my attitude allowed me to stay with those level of players. Probably weren't as good as them as an individual, but um, kind of all round um, allowed myself to kind of compete with them. And then ultimately, I think being as blunt as possible, if you look at the careers that some of these some of these players, I don't even, you don't keep in touch with everyone football, as you know. Um, I don't know if some of them end up being, making a career at all. So it's always interest, always interesting. You always see case scenarios like that. Um, but ultimately, down to your question, I think you, you've got to use it as fuel. You've got to use it in a good way. Two of the guys that, that you're sort of talking about there that were, um, in my age, were, were Matt Ritchie and Joel Ward. Obviously, they were the two guys that were sort of like the poster boys for our age group. And don't get me wrong, have gone on to be, you know, incredibly successful. But like you say, yeah, I was definitely one of those guys who was always questioning whether I was good enough or at the end of every year, I was, you know, I was never sure whether I was going to get asked to stay or not. And eventually, and the reason why I'm obviously talking about myself was to ask you a question is eventually that sort of, I didn't believe in myself enough to ever feel like I belonged or was good enough to, to compete with the other guys until I'd left and then used that feeling to sort of fuel my ambition to, to basically become better than the guys that had been chosen instead yeah. of me what was your self-belief like at, at a young age um, because you just started talking there about how you were never really too sure whether you were going to get kept on or not did you use that of t eventually to your advantage or, or how difficult was that I think going back to to way you know playing at Sunday league uh, football obviously I was always one of the best um, and, and the same coming through at Portsmouth, one of a, a selected few. Um, there was also some very talented local Portsmouth lads as well that, like you said, whatever um, distractions or just development, they didn't go on develop a career somewhere. Um, I think back then, being so young, I think it's just eagerness and just for the love of the game and just loving to play football. I don't think... I probably wasn't that strong mentally back then as I am now, obviously. Um, but there must have been something inside me to to carry on performing. Um, so, like I said, to be able to compete with the lads that they're bringing in that should have been better than me, really. Um, like I said, it's only when you look now and think, well, obviously I had the drive. Um, as you're aware, there's distractions as, as whatever young kids go through and, and you have to distance yourself from that. Obviously, you weigh, you weigh up the scenario of do I want to be a professional footballer or not, or do I want to be out on the streets? It's a no-brainer for me, but a lot of people do fall, fall, fall to the other way and um, fall out of the game for one way or another. Um, like I said, I always had a drive. At, at teachers had asked me, what, what did you want to be, a professional footballer? I'd always practice my signature in, in, in my diary. Um, I was quite good at school as well, um, and I think... <laughs> going on trying to be a little bit mature now. I always maintained quite a good school ethic and made sure I got decent grades, but I always could only see myself being one thing. Um, and I don't know whether that just gave me the urge and the edge to, to maintain that and ultimately want to, want to succeed. Um, because all I could see myself was, was being a professional footballer. So when people talk about manifestation and stuff like that now, ultimately I was doing that at a young age without even realising it. So what were those early experiences like for you in, in Portsmouth's first team at the time? Obviously, they were a Premier League club, loads of big players. Um, I can imagine, you know, an anxious feeling to, to join in with them in training. And you made your debut as a 19-year-old. Um, you end up scoring a penalty on that, yeah. on that night. In, what were those early feelings like? It's really weird because I, I, obviously I supported the club as, as, as a kid, and a young kid. And as you're aware, living in the area, it... <laughs> It wasn't the greatest club to support in, in regards to success, and then obviously, like that, there was ultimate success. There was obviously winning the league, and then there was the FA Cup. Um, and obviously, the, at the time of coming through the youth team, it was when obviously the club was spending money as well. Then that had a domino effect on on our youth team. But we, we used to do like match prep with the first team every Friday. Um, we're talking about England internationals: Sol Campbell, Jermaine Defoe, Glenn Johnson, uh, Diara. Uh, David James, Carnu. Um, I remember playing uh, a reserve game once. Um, I was either on the bench or involved, and Pedro Mendes, Jimmy Chora, and Carnu played. They all won Champions League football. Um, 
it's like it's going back to what I said. It's only once you actually step away from the situation, and now when you're older, you realise that you know that they were unbelievable times, um, and you do take them for granted. Um, but just being a local lad coming through, you know, we had lads all over the UK that were in the youth team that on a Saturday after the game would just go home. So I'd get they'd give me their tickets, and I I in turn would it, it was that match day duty thing was done on a rotor, but I would end up filling in them a lot of the time just because I like being around the place um a lot different now <laughs> as you know but um it's just a great environment to be in it was and you know some really good characters there um in regards to one of your first questions and about um jobs and for the youth team and that just just how the first team would act sometimes you'd be scared of them I, I'd be scared some I'd, I'd speak to them I've always been confident but you're, you're in awe of them I don't think young lads are like that anymore, um, which in a way could be a good thing as well. So tell me, is there anything that sticks out in your mind from those experiences with, you know, he's talking about Pedro Mendes, he's talking about having a chat with Michael Brown at breakfast. Um, those exceptionally talented, Diara went to Real Madrid, those exceptionally talented midfielders that Paulson have had that you were able to take anything from during that time. I think if, if I knew what I knew now, um, back then I probably would have, been more focused on that central position um, but I just think small things like you know Wellington where we used to train so we used to train on the top of the hill the first team used to train on the bottom if we're finished before them you should sit there and watch training all day Jermaine Defoe scoring goals and whoever making passes um, yeah so it wasn't I think until I got into signing my pro that under Guy Whittingham Portsmouth then made a development squad, so it was those players too good for the youth team. Obviously not at first team level yet, so those one in between, which I think nowadays is like the 23 squad. So that was when you'd fill in a little bit more with training or you train on your own and um, just the level of quality, mate, was you can tell some of them players just, just like in the rondos and that it was a level above. Um, and ultimately, I think as, as, as you're well aware, as everyone, the more you train or play with better players, it ends up bringing bring the quality in yourself a little bit more and makes you sharpen in your tools a little bit better. So um, I think being in around those players as well, I think even the small things like it's never, ever been um, in football for the money, but you see some of the cars and that they're driving, you're thinking, oh, I want that when I'm younger. I want that when I'm older. Um, and the stuff that they used to wear, not always my cup of tea, <laughs> but you know, you've, you know, these lads are on big money um, and ultimately that's, that's what you want to get to when you're older. Doing a little bit of research on, on you for this conversation, mate. The interview that you've just given at Portsmouth, obviously their emphasis on, are oh, you coming back? Um, and they asked you a couple of times about your experiences before. And your reaction to one of the questions was that you were disappointed with your first experience at Pombe's first team um, and how the experience of being released actually ended up turning into a positive. Um, can you allude on that a little bit for me? Yeah, um Obviously, Portsmouth from the age of like six till 20, a um, couple of loan spells in between. Portsmouth at the time of declines, probably strong, but have gone from, you know, established Premier League side to then dropping in the championship. Um, and then that's probably when you're thinking, oh, maybe there's a chance there for me. Um, Matty played quite a bit and, and Joel was starting to establish himself. And... I probably thought I was next in line in kind of like the hierarchy. Um, but obviously it wasn't to be. That's football. Went out on loan. Um, first loan spells at 18 to Wickham in League One. Uh, Peter Taylor was the manager, the ex-England um, under-21 manager. Did quite well there. New manager come in. Uh, obviously loan got sent back. Then went on loan to Dagenham and Redbridge in the January window for like a three months emergency loan spell. John Steele was the manager. Um, very direct style of play, uh, facilities weren't great, a great bunch of lads, men, I'm an 18 year old lad here, um, away from home, living in Essex in a hotel, um, and then a year after, um, went alone to Cheltenham for a year, played about 30, 30 odd games, and then ultimately, of course, I was, I was devastated um, and gutted uh, being released from Portsmouth, but it actually enabled me to go and forge a career that I've managed to forge right now because 
you kind of getting shoved into the real world. I had to make a name for myself. Luckily, or luckily or not luckily, I had been on loan previously, so I was out there. Um, and I've all even though when I was on loan, um, you come home quite a lot. Um, so the first time, as much as my loan spells, I'd lived away from home for a couple of days a week. I've, I've had to move out of the city for the first time. Um, so you're not in that comfort zone. Um, you're out of a comfort zone and moving to a new place, meeting um, new players. Also, as a sign in from a, 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 a bigger team, there's more expectation. Um, and like I said, for me, it really, it gave me that platform to then ultimately go and play as many games as I have done. And like I said, just then probably having a career that I've had is just by going out and playing. Um, and I know football's a little bit different now in regards to the, to the youth set up and the academies and the 23s. Um, but for any young lad I speak to, you have to go out and play football. You have to go out and play football. If you were getting a job anywhere else, people will look at your CV and look for your experience. It's no different in football. Um, and I just felt like I matured, obviously, as a footballer, but I think more importantly as a human being as well. And, um, yeah, like I said, as much as at the time, and it was very raw, looking back at it now, it was definitely the best thing that had to happen for my career. I think that hindsight's obviously wonderful, isn't it? So you know that now. Um, but at the time, and I can relate to that because I, I went through that, obviously, a few years before when you get released by the club that you have dreams of playing for. It's sort of devastating, isn't it? But yeah. I had a conversation with someone the other day and, and we were talking about elite players and how more often than not, I'd argue almost all footballers that have made a career out of football, you're now 13, 14 years deep in, into a career, have had at some point something to get over, a hardship or, or somebody telling them they're not good enough or being released from a club, something that, that has put them down that they've had to get over. And, and I think really that sometimes separates people who have good careers from the people who obviously as, as you've previously mentioned who can sort of wean off and, um, and, and step out of the game how important looking back now were you getting over that feeling to, to you obviously going on to, to have a successful career well, like I said I think I kind of knew my next step anyway because I did relatively well at Cheltenham and the manager did try and sign me in January it was quite late um, I think the difference is maybe with some lads, if they did get released, I, I had a club ready to take me. Um, I, I probably did have other options, but I was fami familiar with the setup at Cheltenham. I got on well with the manager. I've also gone from a really small fish of the Sailing and Football at Portsmouth to a really big fish in Cheltenham. Um, and I think, regardless of who you are, regardless of how strong your mental state is, it's good to feel wanted. It was really good to feel wanted. and obviously, to kind of build a team around me. So, um, and I think we, without realising once again, obviously, I think you do use it as fuel. So, um, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit now, but the guy, the, the manager, um, yeah, released me at Portsmouth for Steve Cottrell. Ultimately, when I end up signing for Bristol City, after six months, Sean O'Driscoll left and Steve Cottrell's come in as manager. Um, and then you've got, another kind of set of problems there where you're thinking oh hold on this manager's just released me um i'm not going to play here um so i think when, when you actually word the questions how you do it i've been probably thinking that my career's been quite plain sailing but when you actually break it quite down i think i think it's true that you do have to go through these these moments of hurt and being low but then it's how how do you get up from that and how do you use it um it's, it was never a burn enough, never burning in the back of my head to think, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I think at times it just comes natural to probably to the person that you are. Um, and then if it doesn't, then you can kind of look at yourself in the mirror and think, oh, do I really want this? Do I want to be a professional footballer? So how aware do you think that young guys need to be now before they've started their football career that it's not going to be plain sailing? That, you know, I can speak to you now and, and we can go over the stats of your career and you're just about to hit as you know, we spoke about before, 500 league games, 600 appearances. It's incredible. But from the outside looking in, that might seem like, oh, like, well, what an incredible career. That must have gone so well every single time. You've never had any setbacks, but that's not obviously the case. The reason why you have been successful is because you've been able to get over anything that's been thrown at you. How aware, going back to my question, how aware do young guys need to be that it's not going to be easy for them to be successful? 
I think I think I can obviously s- safely say now, obviously with, with those games you just said at my age, that I've been able to make it as a professional footballer. But I've also seen cases where lads have been a professional footballer for a year, two years, and fallen out of the game for one way or another, especially how it's going now with the finances, whether that's uh, an impact of COVID or just football finances in general. Um, it's been a lot harder um, being in a position where you're out of contract in the summer. And I, I, like I said, I was coming off a um, being out of contract from a championship team, but playing a lot throughout my career. Um, I think you have to be aware. I, I, I don't think you can ever be comfortable. And I think the moment that you start becoming comfortable is then when you, you've got to start really looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking, do, how am I going to be able to forge a career of longevity? Um, because it's that balancing act again when you go back to maybe getting quite a lot so early in your career without actually... I think work, the, saying working for it is hard because I never come across players that don't work hard. There's some that work hard more than others, but sometimes players are a little bit more talented than others. Um, I just would never, ever settle for being okay or good. I think you've always got to keep driving and keep striving for being as best as you can, doing extras, watching, watching clips, asking your manager, speaking to players that have been there, um, and ultimately trying to get better each game. And I think being honest with yourself, I think throughout my career, I've been honest with myself in regards to my performances. I think that's key. I think I've always been one that I think you've probably been in a lot of dressing rooms where um, players have probably a, a false sense of their ability and, and what they deliver. Um, I think I've probably always been my harshest critic. Um, I think that's allowed me to continue to improve throughout my career. I'm so glad that you've just managed to break down a little bit we'll get into it a little bit more but you've broken down what hard work looked like to you because you know I listen to a lot of podcasts I I speak to a lot of people about football and and sometimes hearing somebody say oh I worked hard isn't really enough it's it's not information for me to be able to give a listener on on somebody trying to improve their game that everybody knows that hard work is is sort of goes without saying but trying to break down what that looks like as as you've just sort of alluded to there is is super interesting so but I have got some numbers for you because you did obviously when you did move to, to Cheltenham permanently, you end up playing um, over 120 times in, in the space of three years. He scored important goals. He played in two uh, playoff campaigns, which means obviously you were successful two years running. Um, I am interested for the benefit of, of obviously for younger players who are listening at a similar age. How were you able to play consistently at a young age whilst also gaining experience and learning about your own game at the same time? I think, honestly, at, that obviously when I was at Cheltenham, it was a League Two level. Um, they were brilliant for me. I, I, fantastic and utmost respect for that club. They, when I say that platform, they gave me that platform after being released from, from Portsmouth. Uh, the manager was great. The people in the town, that was great. Really lovely place to live. The lads were great. Um, when you're going back to it was, success, it was a success, of course, it was looking at it on paper, but first year we got beat in the playoff final. Second year we got beat in the playoff semi- semis. I had a penalty saved. I was 21, maybe 20. I remember doing an interview after and I'm in tears. Um, and I'm out of contract in the summer, probably going to leave as well. Um, so I've obviously gone a little bit ahead there. But in regards to the playing... You had um, scored a free kick, though, in the game before, right? To, that was, to in, get them that in was the first year. In the, right, right, so, right. Yeah, so mm. first year, playoff semi-final, I scored a free kick to seal a win. Uh, it was on Sky. We got beaten by a good crew side that, that day. We fancied our chance. We should have gone up automatically. I remember watching end. that game. They had a good young team Nick crew, Powell didn't they? Yeah, he scored them right in the top corner. Yeah, Ashley Westwood and mm. Luke Murphy. They had a really good team now looking at it, but we should have gone up that year. And then second year, same top three throughout a lot of the season, just fell away. And then I actually was going to Swindon in January, agreed to sign under De Canio. Um, got like a phone call at 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the um, night saying, has it gone through? Matty just left to go Bournemouth. Obviously, he's, he's not told me and he's, he's seen the issues ahead. Anyway, they were under a transfer embargo in the end, so I couldn't sign. So I had to go back to Cheltenham with the towel between my legs. Um, missed a couple of games and ended up playing towards the end of the season 
Um, and we got, like I said, we got beat in the playoff semis, and I had a penalty saved at one nil down in the second leg. Um, yeah, so it's ingr- just to play. I think if I'm gonna be honest, I, 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 I obviously didn't have the mindset now and looked at football how I do now. Back then, I was just enjoying it. Obviously, I was in an environment that allowed me to to flourish. Um, some really good old pros that probably reckon, uh, recognised my flaws, central midfielder partner that we had a good relationship with. Um, it was, I think back then it was more just the love of playing football and, like I said, probably being a, a, one of the better players in the league, scoring some good goals, um, probably getting the headlines a, lot, a little bit more that I wouldn't have been used to before. Um, it wasn't football back then I'm going back then as if it was age ago obviously it wasn't in the place that it is now um, so in regards to like your leg strength and your rehab your gym stuff it wasn't and one we didn't have the facilities there um, but I've always seemed to have a robust nature mentally and physically to just being able to play touch wood my injury record throughout my whole career has been really good I've had one injury when I signed for Cardiff and done a hamstring which how I play is very rare that was just a just an absolute freak injury um so i've just been lucky like that but obviously as i got older I've, I've looked after myself a little bit more but in regards to the cheltenham thing i think that was just kind of eagerness um just loving football and being in an environment that allowed me to do that as you know obviously from similar sort of area and on the south coast most guys who, who do play professionally, you're aware of one another. You, you, you know, you check up on one another. If, say, you know, I've watched enough of your games across the years, the, the ones that have been on telly. Yeah. We spoke before about, you know, I watched a couple of Cardiff games last year that you were involved in. Um, and your ability to, to be able to find a pass and to be in control of the game, um, to strike a ball really well, whether that be obviously a long pass, free kicks, penalties, whatever it is. You've obviously always had the ability to, to be comfortable in possession of the ball, right? And that's, that's sort of what your game's been measured on. But that's not necessarily something that at the time when you were growing up at, in a Portsmouth Academy environment that was popular, that was, that was being taught. So I'm interested to know how you became that player, almost like, an, and, and I watched a documentary the other day on, uh, on Tony Cruz, right? And, yeah. and they're talking about how he's not the biggest, he's not the strongest, he's not the fastest, but... He's so important to the game and, and so important, obviously, to... I mean, I'm talking about Tony Cruz and, and in no way am I saying that, that you're yeah, a guy, yeah. but you're the same kind of yeah. player, right? That, that people might not see Marlon Pack on, on a pitch as being the guy who scores the goal all the time or the guy... But you see the game and, and you're so important to the team in which you play in. How did you become that guy? Do you know what? It, I think... I don't know if you can remember, but up until the age of 15... 14, 15, under 15s. I was a striker for Portsmouth. And I know everyone growing up was a striker. But when you get to that age, really, it's, you should have you have a position nailed on by then. You might have played in the game. You, you probably won't remember. But um, you know, like those um, inter-age group age. So we had a 15, 16 game. So you, you would have been at the club at the time. Um, someone got injured in the second field. And Roger North... Obviously, you know, is um, Sean's dad, who obviously is, is passed now, bless his soul. But um, I think he put me in centre midfield. And I've done really well um, without no experience of just playing in there. Um, and I think from there, I ended up making that my position. I played for reserves at Portsmouth. I was 15. Um, I said it in my story that, uh, that when I signed, like I was 15, I was in year 10 at school. And in the reserve team game and reserve team game then weren't like they are now it was like Todorov played and so I think it just came natural to me I always obviously when you're younger it's a bit different I was never of, of the size that I was now in regards to being the tallest and everyone I was always a medium build and medium size was never the quickest growing up um, so even at the age of 15 if I was playing striker I'd probably come a little bit more deeper and and play more of a link style. Um, Paul Hardiman, I remember, was really good. He was my under-16 coach, of course. He was really good to me. Um, but when you go to actually talking about learning the position, I never learned how to play the position. 
like if I ever go into coaching now and, and I'm taking midfielders now or even I'm speaking to young lads, I will speak to them about the position of scanning, opening your shoulders, looking for your next pass, seeing where teammates are, how, how are you all playing as a six? Do you have to screen? Are you going tight to the midfielder? Um, but there was never, I can never, never remember any passing drills, any technical advice, any tactical advice growing up playing in that. It's just a role that I developed um, and just played in. Um, it's probably only until I went to Bristol City under Steve Cottrell and Lee Johnson um, where they really made an emphasis of me kind of staying in position in Lee Johnson used to say stay in the cage as such um, and opening my shoulders out and playing but if I'm going to be honest I, I just found a position and kind of naturally worked on it naturally just worked on opening my, my shoulders playing off trying to play off two touch receiving it back foot and punching it um, playing through the lines as much as possible I think I get quite a lot of stigma of playing sideways and backwards but I think for me it's important, more importantly I'm, I will always look forward it's always been in my nature. It would always be in my nature. There's nothing better than crisping a pass through in between lines into a 10, um, giving that reverse pass, playing a big switch, playing a through ball. But I think for me, ultimately, I want to keep the ball for my team. I want to take the scene out of games if you have to. If we're under the cost, I want to, I want to receive the ball in tight positions and keep us playing and keeping us sticking over. Because I think the saying is key is the more you have the ball, the less likely the opposition is going to score. But gone on a little bit there but in regards to actually that position never really anything that someone sat me down and said look you're going to be a centre midfielder this is what a centre midfielder needs to do I started similar to you mate I started sort of like fading back um, <laughs> when I was younger that striker yeah, role you yeah. sort of fade back yeah. and um, and when I was a young guy at Bournemouth I played that midfield position and then even after that I, I, I sort of moved my way back and, and ended up playing defence sort of my whole career really until this season I'm now working with a guy who used to play with at, at Bournemouth when I was a midfielder and he's asked me to do that role again, sort of that, that deep line midfield role. And I find that the biggest thing isn't necessarily the pass in which I pick or, or, or my ability on the ball, but it's the biggest thing is trying to be aware of everything that's going on around you, right? And that makes everything much easier. Um, that's something that you do incredibly well and always have done. And, and, but how important... How a, I'm going to say how important is awareness because it's obviously super important, but how can you train to be more aware? I think ultimately going back to what you said, how do I see it? I think, I wouldn't say that position is the glue that holds the team together, but I think you do a lot of unselfish work as a six. You're locking out when teams are attacking. You, you, it might be it's sound a little bit of it. You don't get the glory as a six, even even the top players in the world, the only ones that do potentially are the ball playing ones. Um, you do a lot of dirty stuff because ultimately, in my eyes, I'm there to give these forward thinking players a platform to go and flourish and for them to go and do their bits in the final third and then making sure that however we are behind the ball, we're good to then obviously reload the attack, lock out and then ultimately put fires out and stop attacks. Um, Awareness, I, I, my boy plays in, a, in, a, in kind of like a JPL academy and I've done like a Zoom thing and a question was, what do you think is the most important attribute for a footballer to have? Um, I didn't say pace because I haven't got that. I said awareness because I just think awareness could be a numerous, numerous things in football. Um, uh, you can go back to the simple things of um, obviously awareness of your next pass, scanning awareness of, to see where the defender is when you're receiving or nowadays of how football is. For me, playing in the six, it's generally the strikers coming in. Um, um, awareness of, like I just said then, when your team's attacking, how, how are we defending in the attack? Um, awareness of how the game's going, how are you going to manage the game? Hold on, are we getting, are we getting penned in here? Okay, we want to play football, but actually... For the next five minutes, we're going to have to play a little bit more direct. We're going to have to manage the game a little bit. So there's so many different variables to have an awareness. And that's why I would go back to having, especially being in that six where, for me, you're constantly on the move, constantly on the swivel, on the half turn. You're either lending a hand in defence or you're lending a hand in attack in one way or another. Um, and it's such a key position that ultimately I love to play because if you're playing in the right team and in the right formation, it can be 
a real fruitful position where you can get on the ball in the half turn and you can make things happen. Um, but you know, I, you know, I, I think it's probably one of my main attributes is having a good awareness. Um, a lot of the time, I think a, a, a lot of the times in my early career, youth team and as a young pro, I got caught a lot on the ball. Where if you, you're kind of square on, you're receiving, you're not checking your shoulders and you're kind of bumping into players a lot. I think as I've got older, I've obviously got a lot better in the position. You make it your own a little bit more and, and you understand like when's the opportunity to open up. You should always have that picture in your head before you're receiving the ball. Um, and the best players in the world, the best midfielders in the world, you watch Tony Cruz, Luka Modric, watch their head, their constant on the swivel. So, without trying to steal all your secrets, mate, is there anything that you do in training? Is there any sort of drills that you, you go back to or, or anything that you do consistently within your own training regime that, that helps you with that? Generally now, I think, um, depending on what you do, there's a lot of, uh, uh, say, normalising a training day. I think as you're, you're probably where you've, you've been in some format where it's been a warm-up, a passing drill, a possession-based drill, and then a... A five zero maybe that that is just generalising a date. It's not as simple as that. Sometimes I just try and get into good habits in that. Always try and get good, uh, constantly trying to make it game related. Whether that's a passing drill, whether that's a possession, constantly on the shoulder, constantly looking, trying to make it like I said as game related as possible. Um, always used to like to do rebound boards. Um, used to have four of them and just pump them in, get on the half turn, swivel, try and move my feet quite quickly. Um, I think I think in regards to possession, in the possession one, I'll try and stay quite centrally a lot um, instead of being on the outside where I'm kind of that link man and then I've got kind of people coming in from everywhere where even I think you, you, you'll probably bet me off that even this, even if they're not there, you can f sense someone's presence a lot of the time. Um, and then... When it comes to, say, more tactical work at the end of the week, it's kind of getting in position of, more predominantly, it's what the manager wants and how he wants the six to be, but then it's more the defensive side of things of kind of screening the striker and then shuffling or nicking the ball from the front. Um, or if you're playing with two sixes, it's having that good relationship where you're dovetailing or one's coming over and you can be seeing the back of... The other six is shirt, so you're in good positions. Um, but yeah, I think once again, it hasn't really been one where I've done loads of extra stuff. I just try and maintain it and get into good habits daily, so then we get into good practice for, for a Saturday. We've spoken about overcoming you know, um, hardships and, and hurdles uh, amongst your career, and something that I wanted to speak to you a little bit about, because I'm not sure if it's, if it's well documented enough, um, not enough, but whether it's been documented about you and that football can sometimes seem on the outside that everything's perfect and it's, and it's been so easy. But that period of time where you've obviously spoke about leaving Cheltenham, in between leaving Cheltenham and signing for Bristol City, you know, I know that period of time was tough for you because it didn't, you didn't just go from Cheltenham straight to Bristol City, right? You had a, yeah. you had a brief moment in time where, where you didn't have a club and you weren't sure what you were going to do and you ended up training on your own. And I remember seeing, I'm not sure if you remember it, but there was an article maybe in the paper, was there? Yeah, yeah, there was. About what you were doing, why you were doing it, and, and what was happening with your career, and, and, and you were quite open and honest. I remember seeing that and thinking, like, how has obviously Marlon gone from, from being top boy at Cheltenham to being in this position? Talk to me about that, about that time. What happened? Ultimately, it was, it was my decision. Um, going back to, it, it was just... We got beat in the semi-final, um, had a penalty saved. Like I said, should have gone out that season. No way you want to end your kind of Cheltenham career. Going back to January, I thought I was signing for Swindon, signed for Swindon, went down there. They were top of League One at the time. And obviously, I, I've done my time at Cheltenham. Two years of... You were ready to progress. Two years of success in, OK, not, not the promotion that I felt like we should have had, but played a lot of games, um, was team of the year for both years, the FA team of the year both years. I think I finished second in my first year to Matty for um, FA pl player 
of the division. So Matty yeah. won it. I finished second. Um, and that's that's uh, that must award. have been the year that Swindon got promoted, was it? Yes, it yeah. would have been. Yeah, um, that's award that the managers in the league vote for. Um, so it was my time. I, obviously, I got offered a new deal at Cheltenham. To be fair to them, they offered me a decent deal for League Two, but I felt like I'd grown out of League Two and I needed that next step. Like Cheltenham was great for that time I created. Like I said, it gave me the platform, but then I needed that next challenge. I think I got probably a l- little bit too comfortable at Cheltenham where I probably was going to play every week. Weight got a bit too high. Um, body fat, as a result of that, probably got a bit too high. And probably took things a little bit too for granted. Um, still done. Things you were still right. performing. To no, that still time. done things yeah. right. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm probably yeah, yeah. exaggerating a little bit, but in regards to how I'd see myself now or how I would do things different and differently. Um, and yeah, then obviously in the summer you're probably in, on, off the back of two decent seasons, and like I said, being in being a team of the year twice, I'm expecting a lot of a lot more probably interest than I did. I didn't play great in those playoff games, which I don't know if that had an effect. Um, yeah, I decided to... I was a free agent. Cheltenham were due compensation, but I'd have been there for two years. Um, they'd have got, they got me on a free from Portsmouth. Still younger than 24. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I'd have been, I think I was 21. So they'd have got compensation, but it was minimal. I think the fee I ended up going for was like rising to 100 grand. It was like 50 grand, so... I wasn't really a risk as such, but um, yeah, I just made sure I stayed fit. Fittest I think I've ever come. And my relationship with fitness has probably grown from that period. Um, I done some work with Gary Clark here in Portsmouth, who's a PT. My dad's mate growing up, played Sunday league, had a gym at Moneyfields. Pompey fan now, so he'll probably appreciate me saying that done some work with a guy called Ian Hutton, was um, done some work with Cheltenham, like part-time, but really good. Put me up in his flat in Cheltenham for a week. I went back to Cheltenham for a week, done double sessions with him every day. Um, I don't know if you've done it, but done some sessions with Northy. Did you, did you do those on the sessions? Be- on the beach? No, I, I, I trained with Gosport Borough for a few days. Um, Northy took them sessions, um, a couple of sessions with Gosport, um, just to get some football in me. Um, I trained with, I think Matty might have organised it, I trained with Northy at Whiteley AstroTurf. Um, yeah, so, but then at time, yeah, and then eventually I went on trial at Bristol City. I've just played probably nearly 80 games in League Two and I've had to go on trial um, for a week in the end. They were always interested and they got an injury in centre midfield. It's crazy how the universe works sometimes. They got an injury in centre midfield like a week before the season. So I went on trial literally the, the week before the first game of the season um, and ended up playing, started in a friendly against Bournemouth on the Saturday, um, who were championship at the time. And obviously had done well and got myself a contract, but didn't sign till the Friday before the first game of the season. So would have gone from Cheltenham playoffs mid-May early May early May and not sign until somewhere till whatever it was first week of August um, and with one friendly game of football in between but ultimately that period of working with personal trainers doing stuff on my own um, going to train at Gospel Bar for a couple of nights a week um, got me in a position where I think I've I think I played, I played 80 minutes against Bournemouth and looked really fit. And then, um, yeah, luckily, I, not luckily because I've put the work in, but, um, you know, football, like, you could easily have had a bad game. Some, we all have them. Um, otherwise, you're up there, your career, you know, at this level, you have bad games. That's why we play at this level. But, um, yeah, played well on a a contract. I want to try and break down that period of time mate if I, if I can really because I think it's so relatable that and it's happening a lot now in football we've just spoken about it you know before we started recording about that we both know people this summer who have who have struggled for clubs really and um, and not necessarily that you were struggling for a club at that time but 
it obviously didn't happen until the week before the season and, and that's a long time for a footballer to, to be out of a deal at, at a club and that whole time that you were using that to stay fit and, and, and to improve yourself there's, almost, there's still a, a lot of uncertainty within that right so how did you manage to focus on getting fit whilst also having that you know that uncertainty in your mind I can imagine it was an anxious period of time for you that you managed to f- sort of fuel that in, in the right direction instead of just thinking oh like it's not happening for me I'm, I'm just not going to do anything and, and tail away from football well being honest I think it was getting to a period where I thought I'm going to go back to Cheltenham here with egg on my face saying I'm leaving and then I'm going to have to come back begging for them Sorry, begging for them to take me back, not begging for them as such, but a lot of pride would have been dented there. But the bigger picture was I felt like I deserved or I needed that next challenge. Um, I, I just, I think I always go back to that. I, either it was, there was inevitability of me going to play a little bit higher or I go back to, I, I don't even do this now, but manifest that I, I wanted to play higher so I just felt in regards to fitness because I think if you look at my first two years at Cheltenham I probably wasn't as fit as I should have been um, and that period in between probably got like I said I probably am over exaggerating myself a little bit but that period in between of uncertainty allowed me to work on my weaknesses um, and ultimately made me a better player um, so doing that fitness work, working on, like for me, it's, it's, it's my weakness, which I think a lot of people would say it would be my speed and, and um, pace as such. Um, so I'd work on trying to be better at that. Um, I think you can only get so, so good as you can work on it, but you can only get as far as you can because ultimately there's, there's genes, there's, Muscle fibers. Listen, you can you can improve to a certain extent with that stuff. Some of us are born with it, some of us are not. That's 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 life, um, and that's genetics. But um, I just kept on chugging away. Kept on. Um, obviously, it was just me and my missus there, and I didn't have any any obligations to what I do now with the family and providing for people. Ultimately, I was trying to make the best for my career, which I would have done in any environment if I was you know, had, had a normal nine to five job, I think ultimately you're striving to be better. Um, and that period allowed me with the help of some really good people that even now I'll always be thankful for because without them realising, they played a quite a big part in me being able to, th- those, you know, s- slight sessions here and there, those weeks of going to them to work, um, they, they weren't charging me any money. They were doing it out of, you know, the, the love of helping someone and um, being good people. So I'll always be grateful for them, you know. Um, and like I said, they, they definitely helped me when I went into Bristol City being probably the best shape of my career. A lot of guys, uh, you know, as I've mentioned, probably will be out of contract even now. We're, we're doing this sort of like mid pre-season, mid-July, Montreal when, when it'll be announced. But um, as we've spoken about, we, we both know people who are out of contract. Like what advice would you have for them on what they can do during this time to, to keep themselves in the best possible shape, both mentally and physically? Yeah, I think um, we have mutual friends that are, are in that position and it's tough. Like I said, me, me being out of contract this summer, I know you've been in the same situation. It is a tough because there is external factors. You've got, ultimately you've got, generally a lot of us have got people to provide for. Um, we've got bills to pay. Um, I know people go on about footballers, but you know, at some levels, it's not what you think. Um, so you've got bills to pay. You, you know, you might have a mortgage to pay for, and um, it is your job. And as much as we love it, also at the same time, it is a job. Um, I, I always think just try and stay at it as much as you can. As if you still got love for the game. Um, and probably these moments is when you start questioning whether you do have love for the game and that's when you've got to weigh up what you want to do. Um, but especially those lads that have experience, I think that's vital because I think in football, um, 
you can't buy that at times, regardless at any level. Um, people that are good in the dressing room, um, that have played at higher levels, that potentially may have to drop down. I think, I think there's an opportunity for everyone. Just sometimes football aligns itself quite tough at times financially and being out of contract, clubs can then use that as an advantage if you've been out of contract for a little bit longer or if you've had a, a tough injury record. So um, just on the back of what I've done, I just try and make sure that I stay ready, stay ready, keep believing that an opportunity is going to come and when it does come, I'm not trying to play catch up. It's hard when you're doing it as an individual because you can't replicate that football work that you'll do in a group. Um, but try and get to a level where when you do go in, you can try and hit the ground running. I mean, you ended up playing 283, you might have been like here or there, but yeah. 283 times for Bristol City. You, you know, you end up there for five years, you leave as captain. How were you able to join as a trialist? You know what being on, on trial is like, and we all know what being a signed player and having a trialist yeah. come in is like. How were you able to go from being trialist to being arguably one of the most important players in the club so successfully? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I quite established myself quite early in the team. Um, obviously, I started the first game off the bench. Obviously, I've just signed on the Friday, so that's understandably, but I did had a, had a decent cameo performance and I think I was in the team in and out, but majority played a lot of the games that season up until Steve Cottrell come in when I was in and out again, but then found myself back in the team and kind of won in round in regards to, um, which is quite rare for a manager. Once, I think you, you, you've probably been in a situation, once a manager generally makes the decision on the on a player, regardless of how long ago it was, they generally stick to that decision. So well, Let's divert a little bit then and we can come back to, yeah. to my original question of you overcoming being a trialist, but yeah. how do you think you were able to, to win over Cottrell? Obviously, I, I, it would have been two and a half years, maybe three years later. So I've got that experience with me. Um, didn't see me probably as a kid anymore. And also the environment changed. He, he come, became the manager of Portsmouth Football Club that still had a lot of Premier League quality. As much as I felt I was ready to play a part, looking back at it now, I wasn't. I was nowhere near it. Um, and I, like I said, I'll be... They're sitting here saying I'd be thankful for the manager for releasing me. I don't think you'd ever, th you'd ever think that. So, um, yeah, he, he was good. He was good with me. Um, and obviously then our, our, our relationship came a lot more fruitful and I still speak to him now and again and try and maintain a good relationship to him because he did a lot for me and obviously I tried to do as much as I can for him and then obviously you sign new contracts and you end up staying at a club for that long it's because a manager likes you or you've done well for a manager and then the new manager comes in and you continue that relationship. But um, then going back to the, the original question of becoming a trialist to um, a mainstay of the team for a long time, um, I had really good teammates. I played in a really good team. Um, you know, the first year was, it was a struggle. Um, club had a quite a transitional period from being in the championship, trying to sign a lot of young players. Um Struggled early on. Um, Steve Cottrell come in. We've done really well and he steadied the ship. And then that summer, so my second season, um, Steve Cottrell's first season, recruited really well. Um, and ultimately, we were the best team in the division. Yeah, you guys walked the league that year. Yeah, didn't we you? signed some yeah. really good players that have now have gone on and had yeah. really good careers um, in the Championship or even in the Premier League. So obviously, the recruitment was really good. Um, and I don't know. I just list, I honestly couldn't put a, a, a finger on it. I, you know, the Lee Johnson come in, and I played a lot under him as well. So, um, I think it goes back to that position and kind of being an unselfish player. I think that um, probably, I think throughout my career, fans' opinion on me has probably been a bit divided. Um, probably even a little bit at Bristol City. Probably until I left. Um, when you start getting a little bit more recognition when you leave somewhere. Um, I think a manager, they, they sense the importance of that position and what you can bring for the team um, just through, you know, for me as well, it's not just on the pitch, it's off the pitch as well. I think you've got to live the life and, and try and be a good role model and, and be a good person. And um, 
be a good professional and, and do the right things. And then unless you're super, super, super talented and one of the best, those off the field habits as well help you get to play in week in, week out. I think a manager would rather have 11 good eggs in his team than seven good eggs and four bad eggs, even though some of those bad eggs can potentially win you a game. I think if he could have talented players and those are good attitudes, he'd play them all day long. Um, I think with managers, it's always about having that trust in a player. And I think throughout my career, generally most of the time, I think a manager has been able to trust me and kind of deliver in those messages and those um, those tactical points and that he wants in a game. It's interesting that you just mentioned there about maybe splitting opinions of fans. And I'm interested to know how aware of, you know, of those opinions are you and what they do for you. And it also sort of moves me into the next bit that I had on you because... That position, and we've spoken about it, and you've just said the word unselfish there, and, and you may not get enough credit, well, not enough credit, but you may not get the credit that supporters might not see a game. And obviously, if someone scores a goal and assists the goal, but you've been the, the guy in midfield who's shored everything up, you might not get any credit off a supporter, right? But you guys went on, on an incredible League Cup run one year. You beat, I've got them written down here, you guys beat Watford, Stoke, Crystal Palace, and Man United on your way to uh, you know, a semi final home and away leg with City in which Pep himself obviously speaks about you in public and, and, and obviously talks about how good of a player you are. So going back to dividing fans' opinions, one first part of the question is how aware of fans' opinions are you? And the second part is when Pep talks about you as being a good player, like what, what does that do for you? I've still got the video on my phone, yeah. Um, that would go with me to the grave. And listen, if anyone wants to say anything, then I can just either put that video out and say look best manager in the world says I'm a good player who are you no um, I think when you're younger I think we all go through it I, I know players still do now but I was a lot more aware still aware now of course you are it's it's society it's not you can go on I'm not huge on it now because I feel like there's a balance and I understand I, I'd like to think I'll try and give back as much as I can I'll try and do birthday messages I'll try and interact with people but it's hard because once you give I know it sounds true but once you give to one it's when when do you find the opportunity to give to someone else or and I found sometimes you get into a little bit of it becoming a match report or if it was on Twitter or Instagram and it's a balancing act of not falling into that trap or apologising every time you lose because ultimately as a footballer, you don't go out. You're not trying to, to lose, yeah. No, it's the worst feeling in the world. Um, but yeah, I think when I was younger, you'd, you'd go on the old forums and you'd see, I think you'd definitely go on it more when you know you've had a good game. I think that's human nature. Um, and as I've got older, I don't know, I've, I've always felt like I've had quite stable mentality in regards to I never get too high. I enjoy it. Of course you do. You've got to enjoy those moments because yeah, when you look at it, it in, in, in a shape of life, it's a short career um, of getting to do something you love. So when you have those moments of highness, um, you've got to enjoy it. But And also when, when, when those low moments come, you've got to learn from it, of course, and use it. And then also realise that potentially you could have a stinker on a Tuesday there's a game on a Saturday. You score an own goal, you could have your worst game, but on a Saturday you might score the winner. So it quickly changes. You could be the best player and, uh, in the paper, you can get man of the match, but then the next game, everyone could be slagging you off. So, listen, I think, ultimately, my teammates and my manager opinions, we all want to be adored by fans. Like I said, I touched on previously, to, to feel wanting to... And, People to say nice things about you. Of course, it feels good, but the way of life at the minute is, is you, you see any, on anything on social media, someone can put something. I see it now with um, players signing for new clubs and then um, fans from their previous clubs who messaged on the new club's Instagram saying, he's rubbish, what, oh, you've got yourself a bad player there. So I think... I'd be lying to say if you're not aware of it. Um, obviously, for me to say I've got divided opinion, obviously I am aware of it. Do I care? Honestly, not really. No. Um, would I want everyone to love me? Yeah. Like, but 
would it affect me playing week in, week out? No. Will I still go and get on the ball? If I lose the ball in possession, give the ball away, my next port of call for me would be to play a simple pass. But would, that, would I hide in a game? No. Um, so I think it, it depends on your headspace, really, and, and how, sh- how strong and kind of um, tough-skinned you can be. Um, and you've probably been in dressing rooms where players, it, it can affect players. Um, but ultimately, I probably wouldn't have had in my career if I've allowed it to affect me in, in, in the way that it, it can do. Do you think that thick skin that you've got is, is something that you had naturally or something you've developed over time? No, I, I've, I've never really cared like what people think. I'm, I'm, I mean, ultimately, for me now, like I said, OK, I'll go back to football and i say my teammates, my managers, but for what my family, my wife and my kids think, that's all that matters to me. And if you're true to yourself in regards to match day and performances, you should know if you've, if you've done all right or if you, um, if you play about. I, I, I know in some games I've done quite well and done a job for the team. Probably six and a half, seven out of ten. But I might have gave the ball away once and only people remember that ball that I've given away. Listen, it's circumstances and sometimes the narrative might be that, you know, Marlon Pack, he's, he's not quick, he's, um, he's not skillful. But there's, there's a role to play in a team and um, sometimes that's the nature of the beast. Is you've got a ride of it sometimes and take everything with a pinch of salt. Um, but it's not as easy for some people to do that. I, yeah, I totally agree. It's it's something, I think, the way that football has gone as well, that, you know, I'm 32, you're 31, so we now know that being thick-skinned is, is part of the game, really, and, and loads of different people are going to have opinions. I think that what, something that young players do now, unfortunately, is change their perception of themselves off the back of fans' opinions. So, yeah. you know, young players are now wanting to be accepted, probably more so by fans than they are maybe their manager or their teammates. Yeah. Um, and that's something I think that is... I wouldn't argue that it's wrong with the game, but I think their, their attention on supporters' opinions, and supporters will watch this, uh, of course, no doubt, and you've already mentioned it. it, everybody loves to be loved, right? It's an amazing fever when supporters like you, but if they don't, I feel like what I'm trying to get is, is you can't change your, your own opinion of yourself or change how you work or, or change the, the desire that you have to be successful because uh, a fan may have a negative opinion of you, and I think that having spoken to you obviously about this and, and the way that you speak about it very maturely is that you have managed to be successful. You've played almost 600 games as, as a professional footballer and that's genuinely, I've mentioned it already, it's genuinely incredible. And you're aware that some people like you and some people don't. I, I, think, think, I think ultimately that's, that's life. People are going to like you, people are going to dislike you. It, I would have been more disappointed if people said, oh, he's lazy, he don't work hard. Because, like I said, going back to that's stuff, something I can control. Like, I can give, regardless of the team I play for, I'll always give 100% for the shirt. I know that could be a little bit corny, a little bit cheesy, but I know what it means to be a football fan. I know what it means to those fans. And ultimately, as a, as a sportsman uh, and being in the environment, I want to win. I want to win. There's nothing worse than losing, um, whether that's a five side game in training, like, to... I think you need to have that mentality. Not everyone does because um, some people do it just because there's a job and, and fortunately they've been blessed with amazing skills and natural ability. Um, but just being a sportsman, I think, I hate losing, I hate losing. gets a little bit easier for me as I've got older, as I've had a family, when you get distraction um, away from the football field. Um, Saturdays, half five, I used to be a nightmare. You know, if it was just me and my missus and we have plans for dinner, they, they, would, they would get cancelled. I wouldn't want to be seen out. I'd feel embarrassed sometimes to go out. But now I look at it and think, oh, hold on. Like, it is a game of football. And I know not everyone wants to, to hear that. And there's a time of place, I think, when you lose certain games and certain performances, just don't go out. Like, and I, I, weirdly enough, speak, listen to Talk Sport at the minute, and they're having like a, a debate on Jesse Lingard because he's obviously not moved anywhere yet. He's been linked to Nottingham Forest. He's been linked to West Ham. Um, I know this is not about Jesse Lingard, but we're talking about the state of football and he's posting pictures of, on TikTok of dancers and that. But the argument was, which I think is a good one, being in the football, hold on, do you want him to be pictured going out drinking every night? So where's the balance in that tier? Like, what do you want? It, do you want people just to be recluse and just go home from football and just have football? Um, 
which I think people do and realise you are just a human. Like you're just this normal person that you're luckily to to play football. So, um, yeah, it's. It, I think you need to be a little bit aware of, of kind of how fans perceive you at times, but it depends how you are as an individual to how you want to take it. And as always, everyone's different, so people will take it different. I'd also argue that, you know, that emotive state that you get after games and for whatever reason they've not gone well is, is part of the reason ultimately why you have been successful as well, because yeah. you care, you know, in that way. Um, so I'm sure you would have been aware, right, when, when you go from, I mean, I know Bristol City to, to Cardiff isn't quite Bristol City to Rovers, like, say, Matty Taylor, for example, but you must have been aware that you were going to get some sort of stick for, for doing that. What, what was that like? Yeah, um, yeah, of course. Um, and I've had mates that have done the same move. and um, Bobby, so it's actually quite a popular move, uh, in a way, yeah, isn't it? Quite right, a, yeah. Yeah. Bobby Reid done it, who's a close friend of mine, um, the season four, yeah. Um, I had an unbelievable time at Bristol City. Still live there. Um, I think when you, it'd be one of the clubs that I'll always have a strong affiliation with because I've had, I think, throughout your career, the teams that you have the most success with, if you gain promotion regardless of what division, it's the best part of your career is yeah. the best part of your career because you could have a long career, you can have a fantastic career, but you want some glory, like you could have great finances and earn a great career, might not have to work again, but um, you want some legacy as well. So um, I've been lucky enough to win something at Bristol City and made some great friends. I think if you've been successful with a team in a, in a group, you tend to be closer to those teammates than players that you haven't been that close with. It's similar to Cardiff. They, they got promoted. I don't know a lot of them lads there. Um, are a lot closer just because of the emotions and the bond and that you share. You see each other daily. You see each other at, um, in a football environment probably more than you would a lot of your family members. Yeah, success can really create that. And when you're talking about that emotion, you, you see players go through injuries, um, be down after defeats. You see people, people like, I know it's stupid, but you see people in the showers. You see everything of everyone and what everyone goes through daily. So, And because you're all generally on the same wavelength, you understand each other a bit better and, and you could know someone for a year and he could be your best mate. You know, I had, I had a lot of great school friends that I speak to now and again regularly, but obviously our paths were like that. So my closer friends now are the lads that I've been in dressing rooms with because they get it. They, they get it. And also the families get it. The wives get it. It's not just you living the lifestyle. Your missus, your kids are. Um, so it really builds so those strong relationships and, and bonds. So, yeah, so going back to Bristol City and then leaving the Cardiff, I think, yeah, it was obviously nature that you're going to get a little bit, but I think deep down I knew I had a good relationship with Bristol City um, and they probably knew that it was maybe time for me to go. Um, we didn't, we did well at Bristol City with a cut run, probably didn't. Probably should have got at least the playoffs one season that was there, but they were bringing in some more players, even though I felt like I was a key member of the squad on and off the pitch. Sometimes you have a sense of actually maybe I need to go to once again, step out of that comfort zone, um, kind of retest myself in a different environment in, in front of the uh, new fans. Um, obviously a new manager, new teammates that you need to try and impress. Um, and also Cardiff just got promoted from the Premier League. It's a, it's a massive club and it was an opportunity that at the age of 28, I think it was at the time, that probably wouldn't have got again in my career. Um, and then, yeah, you, you get the odd um, snake emoji on, on Instagram, but if you can't take that, then, you know, you, you've no point being in football. Okay, mate, just to, uh, to finish it off, I've, I've, you know, I've got a few questions that... They're quick, they're quick fire, but yep. they end up being a bit more slow fire yep. because I'll, I'll delve into them a little bit more as we go. But what is the best piece of advice you've ever received in your career? Oh, I'm putting you on the spot with a few yeah. of these. Um, best piece of advice I've ever received. Um, 
You know, I can't really think of one like, significant advice where I think generally in football, like, I think you take segments of a lot of influential people that you've worked with, um, managers, coaches, teammates, of, um, and it's probably going a little bit back to I think, and it, and it can be just a statement where you think, okay, what's that? What's what's the variables of that? But I think it's working hard, having a good at- attitude, and then working on, for me, working on your weaknesses to then. So it wasn't. I'm not saying there's a statement here. Da 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 da. Mm. It's kind of like working hard, having a good attitude, keep believing, and then work on your weaknesses. And and I think ultimately. So that would have come in different stages of my career, um, and ultimately keep thinking that you never, you never made it as such. Always want to strive for improvements and getting better. Um, and I think even now, extending the question at the age of thirty-one, when I've signed here at Portsmouth, back to my hometown club, my last le- my last game for Cardiff was in February. I played the least amount of games for a long time last season, so now I'm coming into. I want to still improve as a player. So I think when you come in a new environment, new manager, you want to improve. I want to prove myself that I'm still a good player. Prove myself the expectation of coming back to Portsmouth where there's a bit more being a local lad. I'm not a local lad that have come through now. I'm a local lad that have gone away. Portsmouth have ended up being lower than the career I've had. And I've come back with being a championship player. So, um, like I said, it's probably not a, a... you know, uh, a kind of statement or a, a quote as such. It, it's kind of a lot of segment of stuff that keep on plugging away, yeah. I think that's that's quite good advice that, and, and I know a lot of young players probably listen to this can take this from, from you because I can really relate to it, is that when you get to a certain point in your career, and by that I mean most likely youth team, yeah. is, is when I was younger, uh, I'm sure you might have been the same, given the way that you play, that David Beckham was the top boy. He, he, you know, I used to watch him and, and try and em- emulate what he was doing. And then you reach a certain point in your career where you no longer have like a, a role model that's David yeah. Beckham. Your role models become the guys that you play with. Yeah. And, and I remember signing for Bournemouth as a young player and I used to think like, oh, this player does that incredibly well, that player does that incredibly well. So instead of trying to take one thing from one player, I'm not trying to take mini bits from people that I'm around because yeah. they're more relatable to me. Is that what happened with you? I think I think it's not just generally on the football pitch. I think you can look how a player conducts himself. That might be how he lives his lifestyle, how how he eats, um, and how he stretches, how he prepares for games. I, I've been in I've been in loads of positions where I've looked at a player and he's done that, and I thought, why is he doing that for? I'll ask him. He's like, oh, you no, know, I might be doing that. Go to yoga. Or, a couple of lads at Bristol City used to do Bikram yoga. Oh, and Aaron Wolverham, he's a lot older than me. Um, he was like 35 at the time, but he ended up playing until he's like 30, 40 he ended up playing for. So you've got to look at these things and think, well, hold on, he's had that career, he's been doing that. Oh, why, why are you doing that for? Oh, because, you know, it's allowed me to play for so long. Um, and I think that I will want to play for so long because ultimately I, lo- I love to play football. And if you love doing something, so I think the same as, any, same as anything you love doing something you try and maximise um, the career as long as possible um, so it's not just specifics are generally on the football pitch it's, it's the external of, of football life I told you there were slow fire questions mate they're not, yeah. I'm not rolling I'm off a, the time mate, I, I can talk for days <laughs> now, so. the, um, okay next one what was your best performance in your opinion ever um, best performance ever uh, Too many to choose from. No, <laughs> there's not, mate. I told you, I'm average. That's why I've had a career. I've, I've, um, I think it would, so. I'll go to Cheltenham. It was like I did. I don't think I had a great game, but I scored. Obviously, it sticks out on your head when you score. I scored a, re- a decent free kick, reversed it, top corner. Um, I think that. Uh, in that cup run, um, coming up against Man United for Bristol City, um, playing against Paul Pogba, obviously we won a game. 
won it 2-1, coming up against Pogba, played quite well, made a few tackles and then won the ball. Um, there was like a, a picture going around of Marlon Pack's back pocket and it was like keys and that and there was a picture of Pogba. So um, I didn't have him in my back, po- back pocket but I played reasonably well, obviously, as we did as a team. So probably not a set, I wouldn't say it was my best performance, but one that stands, stands out in your mind. my head just because of opposition and, and, um, and it being Man United. How did you approach that, you know, probably one of the biggest games in your career, I'd argue, in, in the lead up to that. How did you approach it? I, th- I think in that occasion, it generally comes down to the manager's behaviour. I think you, you have a sense of him and I, th- I think his, his demeanour going into the game can be infectious on the lads. So if we treated those games, the Man United game and it, even the Man City game, which we lost, but we come out with a lot of credit because of how we played, just like it was any other game. We didn't prepare for them any differently. Obviously, you've got to look at the individuals and the different stuff they do in and out of possession. But in regards to what we did as a team, we did it as if we were treating it like a championship game, which was great for us because we were going really well in the league. We had our philosophy and style of play. We didn't tweak anything, obviously, against the ball. You drop a little bit deeper, but that's just because of the level of opposition. But in regards to being in possession, he wanted us to be brave. And I think that's why we come out with a lot of credit and probably why we got so far in the competition because we respected them, but to a certain level. I remember, I remember watching those games and it wasn't until I watched them earlier this week, obviously, yeah. when I was you know, doing the, the planning for this, that I saw the score lines. Yeah. And, and especially in that City game, you know, I knew that you'd lost a, a semi-final against City, but... I never knew that it was that close, that the, the scoreline was that close. Um, and you, you scored a header, didn't you, obviously, yeah. in one of those games, a flying... flying. Yeah, um, yeah. so we, we went to Etihad, I think Bristol City took about 7,000. We went one the up, yeah, yeah. won the ball off a press, then won a penalty resulting off that press. Um, and then when I'm talking about being brave, we actually were too brave that Man City were playing out from a goal kick. We've had a high press. Brilliant, Brilliant. Yeah. Sometimes you can be too brave in football and it's, it's a fine line of, um, and then Aguero would come on and scored like 90 odd minute header. Um, and then, yeah, at home, uh, we were two nil down, I think. And then I scored to make it two one header. And then we got two, two. And then in the end we went gun home and they scored from like a, a goal kick. So, that was like last minute as well. So it was actually like two injury time winners from us drawing the game. Yes, they were obviously had loads of possession in the game and uh, we were backed against the wall at times, which you're going to have to be. So um, it, it was a fantastic occasion in coming up against um, those players. And go and kind of summarise, and not this podcast, but when you're coming up against those type of players and and we were a top 10 championship type team at the time. And when you're coming up to like Man City and they're continuously pressing you, um, and these are some of the best players in the world, Kevin De Bruyne, for example, um, just his work rate and his ethic and, and those kind of, you'd call them non-negotiables in football. If a player of that magnitude um, and ability can do it, um, then why can't the likes of me and you? I think... I asked Lee, jo- Lee, Lee Johnson said to me at the time he'd asked um, Pep Guardiola a question um, how do you get how do you manage the elite players and, it, and his example was it was a one liner basically well if I can get Leo Messi to do it then everyone else should do it um, yeah, so that you don't see the, the one thing that, I, that strikes me with teams like City and, and Liverpool, you know, the elite teams in this country at the moment and the elite players is they don't seem to have that much of an ego. But you watch City and none of them are like, I'm the superstar. They all just, they're all combining at all times to be a sensational. Like the football is a joke that they play. But it's not like that we're looking at one player and pointing him out that he's the top boy of that club. It's that, that not having an ego thing, I, th- I think is, is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gold in that because constantly we're growing up to be the best. Yeah. But then obviously once you're in that team environment and you're in an elite level, the best teams are the guys without the egos. I think 
for me, I've, I've been in that situation, or if I can compare it to that cup run, what stood out for me was the difference between Man United and Man City. Um, whereas the Man City team were as one and, and looked in sync, and the Man United players didn't. That's not to say that, obviously, they're unbelievable players, but it just had they had a team feel of out of possession, in possession. Um, you can see, like the stuff that they would have worked on day to day. Um, whereas Man United seemed a little bit more off the cuff. Um, and I'm not saying that that's not an ego thing, but we played for Cardiff, we played Liverpool in February in the FA Cup at Anfield, and it was the same thing. Had that same feel as when I played Man City. Just the continuous of, of the press. Um, they could have easily, not, not set off, but they could have probably they'd gone into second gear. Taken it easy. They could have taken yeah. it a little bit easy, but... They still had the same principles as if they were playing Man City. And obviously, as a player, that's what you want. Um, it was hard in there because you feel like you're, winning the, you're, you're dropping so deep as a team. You're winning the ball back, but then their press and transition is so good. They, you, you feel outnumbered the whole time. Um, and like you said, I think that's what um, those elite teams, that's what, that's what they have, that have. That's what sets them so far apart from probably... The other teams that you feel like should be competing, but they don't because, particularly in the Premier League, Man City and Liverpool are obviously the best to do it, and probably in in Europe as well. Who's the best player that you've played with? Played with oh, um, <sighs> Carnu at Portsmouth. I didn't play loads. I think lad that I played with loads, Matt Ritchie, or was always good. I think. We go, we go with someone, we get judged on. It's changed a little bit in football. I think it's going to the other side again. So, especially when we were growing up, you had to be physical. Matt, has never been physical. Um, he won't mind me saying it's not. Um, I'm not, I'm stating the obvious, but technically, he was always unbelievable at a good age. Um, right foot, left foot, you can tell. And obviously, the career that he's gone on to have for himself, it speaks volume. Um, Bristol City likes to lead Tomlin, just a maverick, just natural ability. Um, don't matter what size he is, when we're talking about hard work, and he just had that natural ability. Um, and then like, likes of Bobby Reed and stuff like that, a really good kind of like street footballer that have turned it into the pro game. Where by the side, he was unbelievable, couldn't get the ball off him. Natural footballer that you could just watch all day long. So little mix. You've had him on here, Adam Webster, Webby. Um, I know we'll definitely probably watch this as well, so I'd have to say <laughs> it. But season, uh, he was a young lad coming through at Portsmouth, so I knew him, but didn't really get to cross paths with him and such. But yeah, the season that he had at Bristol City was unbelievable. We we dovetail quite well because we played a two, but I'd sometimes come in centrally and join a three, and he'd step through on his left foot, and I, I'd fill in for him, or we'd play. We'd have a, we had a good relationship, and um. Same again, he can hit a, a huge 60-yard left foot diag, um, probably better than he could have with his right foot. Um, and for what he's done at Brighton, he's been unbelievable. And I just hope for him next, really, he gets an opportunity to play for England because um, I'm talking about all this technical side of him being a footballer and how good he is as a, as a footballer. But ultimately, being a defender, he's a very good defender as well. He can, he can also play the ugly side of the game as well because... He's come through the divisions, League Two, League One Championship, and now now doing really well for Brighton. So, yeah, a bit of a mixed bag of players there. I think if if obviously if we're lucky and on leave no doubt that Portsmouth fans obviously will watch this because because you've been on here and um, we'd be someone I think that when we're talking about people that you've played with that you can feel more relatable to. I had a month with with Webby at Aldershot when we were much younger. He went on loan, obviously from Portsmouth to Aldershot, and. And he used to say, like, our oh, Portsmouth fans hate me. Like, they, they batter me. And even in the, in the podcast that we recorded with him, he talks about how much abuse that he got when he was playing as a left-back or a right-back of the, obviously, the supporters that are so yeah. close to the, to, the, to the pitch. And he questioned whether or not he even wanted to play. And, um, and now he's gone on to, you know, he's a 20-plus million pound player who's almost triple figures appearances in the Premier League. It's, it's, it's crazy. And talking about Matty... I've recorded with Matt as well. It's by the time this one gets released, I'm sure Matt's will, will be released. And one of the things that I spoke to him about that I was able to take, even though we're at the same age, 
was just his unbelievable enthusiasm for the game, right? Yeah, he, he's always had that, yeah. He was just, like, we're talking about, obviously, football going to a place now where there's sports science and stuff, and he talks about it in, in our conversation that he, he's being told constantly, like, Matt, you've got to come in. Matt, you've got to come in. Like, he's just so obsessed with football. It's so refreshing. And I remember questioning my, like, I feel like I love the game, right? But I used to look at Matt and think, like, I don't love it as much as he does. Like he, like the stories of him, I've, you know, I've had a story of, of a guy who, who we used to play with, Simon Francis, and him and Matt go cycling with one another. And Fano turned up to Matt's in all the cycling gear, ready to go. And Matt said, no, 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 we're not going yet. We're going to play two touch in the garden. Fano said, well, what are you talking about, mate? We're going cycling. He goes, no, 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 two touch. In the, and they played for an hour, two touch in the garden. And Fano didn't, he couldn't say no. And this is just Matt constantly, constantly, constantly being in love with the game. Going on Matt and when we're saying about taking um, things off uh, ex-teammates, just when you were mentioning his name, Enthusiasm, you'll probably remember him. I can just remember it, like, when you talk about Enthusiasm, if we're doing a passing drill, he'd scream for the ball, scream, and he'd point to where he wants it. So those, those little things, those little one percents that he, he's always done it. When I've played, like, five sides of him, he's always done it. Um, and it goes back to having enthusiasm and just a demand of give me the ball um, and being a good, good communicator and being vocal, which I think now that every player should have and try and work on because that's a game side of the game that you, you should work on. Um, but that just sticks out on my mind. And obviously, like, go on the technical side and um, of how good he was. That's obviously plain to see, but just that enthusiasm and desire to get on the ball and make sure that you passed it to him. Uh, last one, mate. What piece of advice would you give to a young Marlon Pack that's just starting out his career in football? Um, I think the only piece of advice that I'd probably give myself, because if I'm going to be honest, uh, the journey that you do go on, do you envisage being where I am now? No, you, you hope to be where you are, and obviously you have aspirations, but it is, it is all probably like a pipe dream. So I would have... I've always been dedicated and always had the attitude and you sacrifice but I, I would have liked to have I think if I knew what I knew now I'd like to have been a little bit better probably got fitter earlier worked on my weaknesses earlier um, got my diet sorted better um, but I suppose at the stage of where football was then to where it says now it, the game's developed um, so so vastly um, and probably just say stay true to who you are um, which I feel like I have done and, and um, try not to be fake's the wrong word but in regards to being a good teammate or um, a, a good professional um, and I think ultimately being that good professional has probably got me to the stage of where I'm at now um, I feel like there will be a part of me that I feel like could have been there a little bit better. Um, and I'll never look back on my career and have regrets, but maybe if I knew what I knew now and gave it to Marlon Pat then, maybe I would have, I don't know, I think ambition for everyone is to play Premier League football. It's the dream growing up and might get there, but realistically, um, the opportunity for me to do that was probably to get promoted with a team from the Championship. So, a little bit of work to do here at Forza, but never say never. But listen, Marlon, I appreciate it, mate. There was so much gold dust in, Jeez, in that mate. conversation. That, that was genuinely incredible. So hopefully a lot of people listening will be able to take a lot from that and, and use it in their own games. But thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me on.